Hi, everybody. Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to every single one who is connected with us. It's always a joy for us to have you guys connected for our fellowship together. Now, uh, yes, we've taken a break a couple of weeks, and we are ready to launch out. We are ready to do what God has purposed for our local community in the next season. Uh, now, let me give you a, a brief introduction but also more like uh, give you some context as to what I'm going to share with you today and then probably take it on uh, in the next couple of weeks. As I've taken some time to study and ask the Lord what God wants us to do, uh, I believe very strongly that God wants us to spend the next couple of weeks studying about the promise that he has given to us as a church especially us as, uh, you know, this local community that we gather together uh, to Misbah Church. Uh, you know, we've received the promise from Zechariah chapter 2, verse 5. Uh, it doesn't matter if you don't remember it. I'm going to put it up for you on the screen. And this is what the scriptures say. You can read it for yourself. Then I myself will be a protective wall of fire around Jerusalem, says the Lord, and I will be the glory inside the city. Now, this is a promise that's given to our church. Uh, yes, you are, uh, some of you are connecting from different places. You are connecting from, uh, you know, different countries. Some of you are already connected to a different church. But I personally believe, even though it's very uh, personal to our church, I believe there's so much in this series that uh, will, uh, you know, inspire you, impact you, and encourage you in your walk with God. So uh, be connected with us as we go through this promise. What does it mean for us? We are going to dig deeper and ask ourselves, what is God actually calling us uh, as, he give, as He gives us this promise uh, in this new season? So if you have your Bibles, I want you to uh, grab it and open it to uh, Zechariah chapter 2. Uh, verse 5, because this promise is found in the book of Zechariah. Now, uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with this book. Some of you have uh, just heard this one phrase. Uh, one of the phrases that makes the, the book of Zechariah famous is Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. Uh, uh, you know, not by might, nor by power, but by the Spirit of the Lord. If you uh, lingered around Zechariah or the, uh, the books called Minor Prophets, you would have heard about Zerubbabel. Okay, the promise given to Zerubbabel. Now, let me give you some context here. Uh, Zechariah is referred to as, uh, you know, uh, minor prophets, one of the minor prophets, the list, um, you know, you have where you call that as the minor prophets. Now, uh, the reason you call them minor prophets is not because their ministry was small or because uh, of their size of uh, ministry. You refer to them as minor prophets because of the size of the book. Okay, so uh, for example, Amos was in fact what we call a major prophet. He is even though referred or in fact put into a list uh, of minor prophets, he did a major ministry, okay? His ministry was big. He had a great influence, but he's called as a minor prophet because of the size of the book. So Zechariah is not a small prophet, okay, the way we think, but in fact, his book is small and that's why we refer to him as a minor prophet. Now, uh, just before Zechariah, you have uh, Haggai. Haggai is uh, important. Let me tell you why. Because both of these prophets, in fact, uh, or both of them uh, ministered at the same time. Both of them were speaking the same message. Okay, if you look, uh, kind of do a read um, on, on Haggai, you will know that both of them, both Haggai and Zechariah, were calling the people uh, back to uh, God. They were calling them for a project to build the city, to build the temple of the Lord, to build Jerusalem back. That was the message. Now, if you read Haggai, you will know he's, um, you know, very straight. He just uh, speaks to the point. Okay, there is no visions, whereas Zechariah, uh, when he's talking, the, one of the ways that God spoke to him through visions. So you have angels, um, you know, popping up. You have, uh, you know, a man with a measuring rod. We're going to look into it. Then we have, uh, you know, women inside a basket. Then we have those baskets flying. So, you know, you have um, what you call apocalyptic literature. The book of Zechariah is similar to the book of Revelation in the New Testament. But both of them are ministering at the same time, giving the same message. But Zechariah speaks through visions. He's got eight visions because that's the way God speaks. Okay? 
So one of the ways that helps me to, uh, you know, put these two people together, uh, because Haggai was more an elderly person, uh, a more matured prophet, um, not, not matured, but he was actually an elderly person, okay? Whereas Zechariah, I don't know uh, what do you think about him, he was a young prophet, he, he was a priest, he was a prophet, he was a young prophet. Now, uh, one of the ways to put these two people together, okay, and remember who is old and who is young, uh, I think uh, Peter helps us uh, in uh, quoting the pro prophet uh, Joel, okay, uh, in Acts chapter 2, where he says, in the last days, your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, and your old men, they will dream, dream dreams, okay, so yes, Haggai doesn't dream uh, uh, dreams, but he's just coming to the point, he's straight, whereas Zechariah uses, uh, in fact, speaks to the people through visions. He has recorded, uh, you know, visions in his book. So, to give uh, some more information about who, um, you know, um, Zechariah is, because he makes it very clear in the first verse itself that he is the one who is writing. He's the author of the book. And um, Edo is one of, uh, the family name, okay, that's found even in Nehemiah chapter 12, verse 4. Um, this is a priestly name, okay? Now, uh, we think that uh, after the exile, when the decree was given for them to come back to Jerusalem, uh, people were just flooding, okay? We, 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 we might even picture, if we don't know the reality, we, we might think, okay, uh, the whole gang was coming back, okay? All of them came back. No, uh, most of them actually settled in those lands. It was a handful that returned uh, because the land wasn't doing great. They didn't have a king. It was more like a wasteland. They didn't have walls. They didn't have protection. Okay, um, And, uh, you know, it was just a wasteland, but still people returned. Out of 15 people, it is said two people who returned were priests. So this was more a religious return. Okay, They wanted to see the temple of the Lord built. They wanted to see Jerusalem their city built. So not everyone turned. Okay? So this message is given to the remnant that came back into Jerusalem. It wasn't a great time. But it's important. The reason that I say that is because this is a priest now operating as a prophet. This is a priest that is operating as a prophet. This is, uh, I mean, uh, important because uh, when you look at uh, the time, uh, especially from Jesus, I'm, I'm sorry, from Abram to Jesus, you've got 2,000 years. You break it down into four, you've got 500 years, four slots of 500 years. The first 500 years, God used patriarchs to lead his uh, people. He used uh, Abram, he used uh, Isaac, he used uh, Jacob, and then he used uh, Joseph to lead his people. And then the next 500, uh, God used prophets like Moses and Samuel to lead his people. And following that, we know God, uh, you know, appointed kings. God used their family, the princes, uh, kings to lead his people. And then the last 500 years where we find this, uh, you know, God is using priests. Now, this is interesting because even in Zechariah chapter 3, you will, you will come across this, um, you know, where rather than Zerubbabel, who comes from the line of David, being crowned, you have the priest called Joshua being crowned. So there is a prominence given to the priesthood. Why am I saying this? Out of all these, you know, uh, uh, you know, looking at, you know, all these years, you will see that God has tried every kind of leadership. The priests have been given a chance, the prophets have been given a chance, and then the kings have been given a chance, and then it really connects, because in the New Testament, you have Jesus who fulfills all these offices. He's a prophet, he's a priest, and he's a king. And what these uh, officers have failed to do, he accomplishes through the cross. So you have a priest, Zechariah, who is operating here as a prophet. Now, I know uh, that was a little too long for some of you. You wouldn't have expected that, but I need to give you that context Okay, this is more as an introduction so that you will be understanding or probably catch what I'm about to teach you this week and the following weeks. So let's get to the scripture here. Let's get to the passage, Zechariah chapter 2, verse 1 to 5. Here is where we find the promise that's been given to us, okay? Uh, it is 
part of a vision. At the end of the vision is where we find the scripture. So I'm going to read you the vision. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. When I looked again, I saw a man with a measuring line in his hand. Where are you going? I asked. He replied, I am going to measure Jerusalem to see how wide and how long it is. Then the angel who was with me went to meet a second angel who was coming toward him. Then the other angel said, hurry and say to that young man, Jerusalem will someday be so full of people and livestock that there won't be room enough for everyone. Many will live outside the city walls. Then I myself will be a protective wall of fire around Jerusalem, says the Lord, and I will be the glory inside the city. Now, let me, I know some of you are thinking, what's actually happening here? What's actually going on? Okay, let me break it down for you. I'm going to read verse 1 and 2 again. When I looked again, this is Zechariah, when he lifted up his eyes, he says, I saw a man with a measuring line. Now, a measuring line is something that's made a, more like a rope that's made out of wax that is used when there is some building happening. They want to scale something. They want to measure something, okay? And most of the time, these are used by builders back then. So, he sees a measuring line. It's interesting. The question he's asking, he's, he's asking, where are you going? He's looking at the young man. He's not asking, what are you going to do? Because I probably think he knows what it means when you have the picture of a measuring line, it signifies that there is going to be some building happening. Okay, so he replies, the young man replies, he says, I'm going to Jerusalem. He says where he is going, and then he is also replying, even though uh, Zechariah Zachar- doesn't ask the question, he says what he is about to do. He says, I'm going to measure how wide and how long uh, Jerusalem is going to be. Okay, so here is the theme okay, that we are going to do the next couple of weeks. The series theme is that there is going to be some building happening here. There is going to be some building happening here. The promise that was given to us is that God is going to be our gatekeeper and the glory inside. He's going to be the gatekeeper around us and he's going to be the glory, uh, okay, uh, inside us. Now, this picture that, um, you know, I want to uh, help you Uh, with is a measuring line that's being raised over our church. That signifies that there is going to be some building happening, okay? And if you're taking down notes, here is the title of uh, the sermon that I'm preaching to you this morning, is God the Master Builder. God the Master Builder. Now, verse 3 tells us that Um, You know, he goes on to explain what happens in the uh, vision. He says, then the angel who was with me. Now, I want you to actually mark it down because probably he's going to refer a couple of times in uh, chapter 1, verse 6, 7, and 8, and then uh, chapter 1 again in verse uh, 17 and 18, if I'm not wrong, when he talks about his second vision, he's uh, talking to this angel who is with him, the angel who speaks to him. This is an angel who is different from the angel who is going to speak or passes the message, okay, about, um, you know, not to uh, measure Jerusalem because, uh, you know, Jerusalem is going to be expanded. It's going to see a growth that cannot be limited to the walls. So this is an angel who was with him. And as he went out to meet the second angel who was coming toward him, the other angel, so this is not the angel who is with Zechariah, but the other angel who came to meet him, he has a message, hurry and say to the young man. So there is the other, uh, on the other side, the young man going to measure Jerusalem. There is a message for him. Jerusalem will someday be so full of people and livestock that there won't be room enough for everyone. In fact, God says, you will have to leave your plan uh, of, of trying to build a wall around Jerusalem because uh, Jerusalem is going to see a, an expansion. Jerusalem is going to see growth and your own plan of trying to build something here wouldn't work because it, it, it limits the growth. It limits the expansion. Now, it's also important uh, the time when this is said. I t- already told you that not everyone was excited to come back to Jerusalem. Okay? It was more like a wasteland. There were robbers and thieves. There, it was not protected. There was no walls. There was no king. There was no palace. The land wasn't doing great. Okay? It was more like a wasteland. 
and the remnant had returned. And in fact, they had a hard time building the temple. Uh, in Nehemiah and um, in Ezra, if you read those books, you see that they have already put the foundation and it took another 14 to 15 years for them to start the process. In fact, to start the building project, they had put the foundation for the temple, but it took another 15 years for them to start the building. They had gone through a lot. So it is not such a, uh, an exciting time. People are less hopeful. They are, they are very pessimistic. Obviously, this is not going to work. Okay, they keep whining. It was during that time that the word of the Lord comes to, uh, you know, Zechariah, saying that you cannot think or even imagine the growth Jerusalem is going to have, the expansion it's going to have. And if you, if you think about putting a strategy, if you think about, you know, putting up walls because you guys are not protected, let me tell you, that will only limit the growth. That will only limit the expansion. Let God be the gatekeeper and let God be the glory inside because you won't believe, about, believe the expansion and the growth Jerusalem is going to see. So as a word for the church here this morning, I would like to tell that this is an year where God's going to build. This is an year where God's going to build. There's going to be some building happening here. This is an year of expansion. This is an year of growth. Not just this year. This is a reminder for all of us. Okay, we're going to see that um, even though we are picking it up this year and saying this is an year where God's going to build, I believe that God's always uh, been building the church. God's always going to build the church till he comes back. So this is not just the one year that God's going to build. This is going to be throughout. Okay, this is a reminder very specifically for us that let's not put our own strategies, let's not put our own plans to limit the expansion and limit the growth. Uh, let God be the keeper and let God be the glory. So I've got three points for you, okay? If you're taking down notes, here's the first one. Who is building? Brother, you've just told us that there's going to be some building happening. My question is, who is building? Who is building this, okay? Um, here's the answer. God, the master builder, is the one who is building it. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 4. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. God is the builder of everything. This puts it plain and simple. God is the builder of everything. He is the master builder who is building us. God is building us. Now, I don't know whether you've thought about this. When Jesus was here on earth, okay, when he was about to, uh, you know, do ministry in his hometown, in fact, when he was doing it, people were a little... Uh, you know, doubtful. They were a little offended. How come this guy who was with us, who has grown with us, okay, we have seen him in the neighborhood, you know, move in such power. Where did he get such wisdom? And one of the uh, complaints, okay, when they got offended uh, was that, you know, we know this guy. Okay, Mark chapter 6, uh, verse 3, uh, this is one of the things that they say. He's just a carpenter. He's just a carpenter. Now, this is where we get, uh, you know, the information that Jesus was a carpenter. In other words, the word here, okay, I, I know you guys love Greek words. The word here is tekton. Tekton is not someone who just, uh, you know, uses uh, wood to build. Back then, tekton meant that uh, this was a builder who, you know, used uh, stones, used uh, metal, used wood. In fact, when Jesus was here on earth, he was a builder. He was a builder. And again, just to back out here and remind you, he was not just a builder when he was here on earth. Even before he came to the earth, he formed the universe. The word there is framed, uh, you know, a, a phrase or a vocabulary that is associated with the building. He's the one who laid the foundations. So he's a master builder. So Jesus built before he came into this earth, he built, he was wild here on earth. The next question is, is he building today? And I think yes. Okay. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 8 says that he's the same yesterday, today and forever. If he was the builder at the foundations of this world, if he was the builder when he was here on earth, I believe he's building today. 
He is building today. So who is the builder? Jesus is the builder. He's the master builder. God is building, okay? The second point, what is he building? That's interesting. That's an interesting question. What is he building? My answer to that is found in Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. So yes, who is building? God is building. Jesus is the master builder. What is he building? He is building the church. He is building the church. This is why this promise is so, so relevant to us. God is building the church. If there is one project that God is heading till he comes back, it is the church. That's what I told you. We shouldn't be surprised to say, oh, finally God has decided to build the church. No. God has been building the church and he will continue to build the, build the church. I mean, it can be this year, uh, things can turn out very bad to the church in general in our country. Things can be worsened in the following year. But let me remind you, this is an ongoing project. And God is the builder. God is the builder. Now, when I talk about the church here, I'm not talking about an organization. You know, I'm not talking about a platform or a network. Okay, I'm not talking about a forum here. When the Bible talks about the church, it's talking about you and me. It's talking about you and me. Paul makes it clear when he is writing to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. For we are God's, both God's workers and you are God's field. You are God's building. God is not building an institution. God's not building an organization. God is building you and me. This is an ongoing project. Who is God building? God's building the church. And one of the ways that God builds the church is by building your life. One of the ways that God builds the church is by building your family. One of the ways that God builds the church is by building your generation. God's building lives. The, the, the way, um, you know, Peter describes this, he says that God's building us, bringing the spiritual living stones together and making it a spiritual temple. God's building life. God's building lives and families in order to build the church. And isn't it amazing that God is the builder? God is heading this. God is the master builder here. I mean, um, uh, recently I was looking at a land site and having a conversation with one of my friends and asked him, you know, uh, the picture looks good on the banner. Uh, I don't know who is going to build this and how quickly they're going to build it. And with, with some, uh, you know, wrong information, one of my friends said that this is probably going to be built by the Chinese government. That's what he said. But another friend of mine overheard and said, no, Machan, that's, that's not um, the person who's going to, or the organization that's going to build, uh, because he's been in contact um, uh, with, with the construction, okay, uh, team or, or, or the organization that's going to build it. And he said, this is who is going to build it. And he gave some, uh, you know, thrilling information. I was excited uh, that these guys who have built so many other things in different countries, okay, major projects have taken up, you know, a project in our country. And it's, it's good because, you know, there's, there's a thrill that it's going to end well because of who is building it. And there's no one else who can replace uh, the position of a master builder when God is a master builder. It's going to end well. It's an ongoing project. Who is building? God is building. What is he building? He's building his church. He's building you and I. And finally, the question is, how is he building? How is he building? And, you know, if you've been connected to any uh, construction or, you know, have hung around people who speak about construction or even... Uh, you know, had your homes built. If you were kind of involved in that, you know, before there can be any building, one of the first things they would ask is a plan. Okay? We need a plan before we build. You cannot build without a plan. You cannot guess things. You cannot say, okay, round those numbers. Let's assume and build. No, you need a plan. And that's how God works. 
That is how God works. Let me, let me remind you that one of the first things that God literally told someone to build something was to Noah, he wanted Noah to build an ark. And if you read that uh, narrative, you will understand that God was very specific. How tall it needs to be, how long it needs to be, how wide it needs to be, how it needs to be built, what wood needs to be used, what pace needs to be put outside, because God has a pattern. Okay, now look at what he says when he talks to Moses about the tabernacle, about the building of the tabernacle. He, this is what he says. Have the people of Israel build me a holy sanctuary so I can live among them. You must build this tabernacle and its furnishings exactly according to the pattern I will show you. I want you to build, but I want you to build according to my pattern. God is the master builder. God is building you and me. He's building our families. He's building our church. But how is he building? He's building according to his pattern. He's building according to his plan. He's building according to his plan. That is what I would like to tell you. Look at uh, Psalm chapter 127. This is what it says. Unless the Lord builds a house, the work of the builders is wasted. If you want to successfully build something, I think we will have to take up God's plan. We will have to take up the pattern that God offers us. One of the first things, uh, first times that God, you know, stops a project is found in Genesis chapter 11. The people are building, but they're building according to their own plan. And God comes down and looks at it and says, okay, you guys are building according to your plan. This is the Tower of Babel. And he scatters them. You cannot build with your own plan. You've got to embrace God's pattern. You've got to embrace God's plan. And in fact, one of the famous uh, promises that we put on our, you know, little mugs, t-shirts, or, you know, paste it here, uh, you know, in our rooms, you know, have wallpapers in our laptops, uh, is found in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you. That's a builder speaking. That's, that's vocabulary from a builder because God is a builder. He's got a plan. And his plans are not of disaster. It is good plans. It is good plans. So who is building? God is building. What is he building? He's building you and me. How is he building? You know, you can be excited that, you know, there's going to be a lot of building that's happening this year. God's going to build us. We're going to see expansion. Listen, he's going to build according to his plan. And one of the things that might happen when you hear the word that God's going to build you is the temptation to believe that everything is just going to be nice. Everything is just going to be fine, okay? And we're just going to see success only, okay? It's going to be an amazing journey, no doubt about it. That's one side of the truth. The other side of the truth is that if there is going to be some building, then there is going to be some breaking. If there is going to be some building, there is going to be some breaking, if you have ever walked into a construction site, you will know in order to build, they will be ripping down walls. They'll be bringing down some walls in order to put up some stronger walls. They will be moving some frames. They will be adjusting the fences. They will be making a lot of changes. They'll be breaking down things. They'll be molding things in order to build, in order to have a better building. So I want to remind you that as much as we get excited with the promise that there's going to be some building and God is going to build us, God's going to build our families, God's going to build our lives, Break, breaking is part of the process. Being broken is part of the process of being built. So don't avoid being broken because you're called to be built. God is calling us in order to be built as a spiritual temple. That's what Peter says. So you cannot avoid being broken if you want to be built because being broken is part of the process. And I want to finish with this. I would like to show you uh, this picture here. I found this uh, this week in the internet and I think uh, this really brings out what I'm, 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 I'm about to uh, you know, share with you. This really brings out what I'm about to uh, share with you. Um, you know, I don't need to explain what this is. Okay, you know uh, a commode, why it's used for. I don't need to get into the details of, uh, you know, where you use and how you use it. But it's interesting that these guys have really come up with a plan 
and that is probably in their backyard or probably uh, at the entrance of their house. They have actually, uh, you know, put this at their garden, in their garden, and they've got some flowers there. And uh, it, it, to be honest, it, it looks nice, okay? There's nothing wrong with it. It serves a purpose. But here's what I want to remind you. When the manufacturer created it, or in fact made it, there was one particular design. I mean, when he was designing this, there was one particular purpose in his mind. When the manufacturer made it, there was one particular purpose in his mind. Yes, we can use it for several other things. But there is one particular purpose that was in the mind of the manufacturer. That this is what I am making this for. God's plan is the ultimate plan. We can have different options. We can have different ways to go about for, to build our lives, to build our careers, to build our families. There can be different plans. It might even serve a purpose. But I think the ultimate plan is God's plan. Let me read you one scripture that's found in uh, uh, Proverbs 19 verse 21. You can make many plans, but the Lord's purpose will prevail. When God called you into the church, when God gave you his gift of salvation and connected you to be part of this church, there was a purpose. When the manufacturer planned this, there was one purpose. For you to be connected to a local community so that you can expand, you can serve there. You can be involved, actively involved. Because God's the master builder in the expansion and in the growth. You can say that you are okay for different other options that's, ar that's around. But God's plan is the ultimate plan. And that applies to our lives. That applies to our career. That applies to our marriage. That applies to our ministry. We can have so many different plans in front of us, but the purpose that God has called us into, connected us to, given us life for, is going to be the ultimate purpose. So with that, wherever you are, I want you to bow your heads down, and I want you to take this moment and ask the Holy Spirit, what are you telling me this morning? What are you telling me from this passage. I've been speaking to you, and you know well as to where you are, and ask the Holy Spirit. Take a moment, take a moment, and ask the Holy Spirit, what are you telling me this morning? It might be calling you, reminding you that He is not a builder he was laying the foundations of the world. He was not just a builder when he was here on earth. He's still building today. Come to him. Let him build your life. Let him build your family. Let him build your marriage. Tell him, Lord, I'm giving into your plan. I want to build something according to your pattern. Thank you, Jesus for the expansion and the growth that your word promises for our church, for our ministries, Lord. Despite of what we feel right now, despite of the situation in our countries, Lord, and the challenges different churches are facing, you promise an expansion that cannot be limited by human strategies. So we invite you to be the master builder of our lives, of our families, of our, over our marriages, over our careers over our ministries, Lord. Build us. Build us according to your pattern that we may glorify you. In Jesus' name I pray and all of you said Amen. Thank you so much for tuning in and being a part of our uh, service. Uh, I hope and pray that the word that you have listened to uh, really encourages you, inspires you and offers you hope. But ab above everything I, I uh, pray that uh, that God will draw you close to Him, that you will be drawn to God. Wherever you are, you can be far away, you can sometimes be near and not yet with Him. This is the gospel shout, come back to Him. This is the gospel shout that I want to give to you. It's always a good time for you to come.
come close to him. Come to him. Draw close to him and he will draw close to you. And on a different note, if you're someone who is new here and if you haven't heard about Jesus, uh, I would like to ask you a personal question. This is a personal invitation. Despite of your experience, your religious experience, despite of what people have talked and told about uh, you know, Jesus to you, or your experience with people who already know God, uh, here's my personal invitation. If you get an opportunity personally to know God and to be known by God, to know the, the God of this universe who created this world, would you take it up? Despite of your experience, okay? Don't conclude on something because someone else told you that. Don't conclude on uh, a particular matter because that is what other people think. This is a personal invitation to you. If you get an opportunity to know God and be known by God, would you take it up? And if your answer is yes, I am very, very happy to tell you something, that there is a way. What Jesus has to offer to us cannot be compared to anything that can be offered by anyone else in this world. There's a way for you to know God and be known by God. And if you want to begin this journey at your own pace, okay, I would like you to pray this prayer with me. You look, pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I accept Jesus into my life. I ask for forgiveness of my sins. I want to know you and be known by you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much if you have prayed that prayer. I am so excited and proud of you for praying that prayer. And at your own pace, you don't have to do anything. But if you like to get to know about Jesus of what the Bible says and what the Bible offers, we would like to really connect with you. You can write to us if you have any questions. You can write to us as misbahprayer at gmail.com. You've got the email. You can get connected with us as you begin this journey. And on a different note, if you're someone who needs prayer, who needs prayer because you are going through a financial crisis, you need prayer because you are going through a crisis in your marriage, uh, in your relationships, if you're going through uh, a tough time uh, with your uh, suffering a health condition, I would like to pray for you. I would really like to pray for you and pray along with you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your son. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, so that we may have life and life more abundant. You are calling us to live a victorious life. You are calling us to live an overcoming life, Lord. I pray right now to every single person who is connected here that you will give them peace, peace over their lives, peace over their homes, oh my master. I pray restoration. I speak restoration over their marriages, over their relationships, Lord. I pray healing right now, wherever they are. They can be admitted in the hospital. They can be about going for a scan this time. They can be going for checkups this week, Lord. I pray for healing right now. I pray healing over their lives, over their bodies, Lord. Restore, restore good health, oh my master. Father, I pray for individuals who are waiting for a comeback in their life. They've, they've given up. They've, they've left everything. They're so hopeless, Lord. I pray that your word right now and your hand of blessing will be upon their lives, upon their businesses, upon their workplace. Lord, I pray that you will give them the comeback. You will restore their lives, restore their marriages, give peace and joy in their homes because you have called us to live an overcoming, victorious life. In Jesus' name I pray. And all of us said, Amen, Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for connecting with us. I hope that you will have a blessed week ahead, and I pray for that. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for connecting. May God bless you. 